All right, so we're going to introduce the, uh, the last speaker of our session. This is Greg Kompenstein from, uh, looks like he's from, oh, he didn't put it up. Oh, yes, Bloomberg, I could not even read it on the slides. So Greg is going to give us a talk. It's going to be on how to succeed with Python across the enterprise. And the subtitle on this one is by trying really, 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 really hard. <laughs> All for you, Greg. OK, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm surprised with how loud I suddenly am. Um, I was having a little bit of a technical s struggle with the display earlier. Thank you for being patient with that. So um, just a bit about Bloomberg first. Uh, we celebrated our 40th anniversary just last year. Uh, it was founded as a pretty small company that provides information to the financial industry. And uh, over the years, we've grown to be a fairly large and well-established company. We have offices um, all over the world, oh, almost 200 of them. They tend to be in real high-priced real estate locations because we're near financial districts and, and world capitals and things like that. Um, we have over 20,000 employees at this point. Almost 7,000 of them are software engineers. And quite a few of them are using Python today. We've also appeared in uh, television and movies. So if you have a drama or you know, any kind of television or movie show and it finances part of the story um, to look authentic, you have to have a Bloomberg terminal on a desk somewhere. Uh, this is from Billions, but uh, our product has also appeared in um, uh, The Big Short, one of my favorite movies, uh, Silicon Valley and Enterprise. So for much of its history, C++ was the development language of choice at Bloomberg. And uh, in the mid-2000s, JavaScript started gaining traction for UI development mostly. We did do some server-side JavaScript before Node.js was a thing. But um, that aspect of it never really caught on. Uh, Python was starting to make some inroads at around the same time. Uh, myself, I began working with Python at another company uh, around 2007. Uh, mostly started off doing like data massaging. I did build this one large scale automation of uh, processes um, that uh, leverage Python. And uh, I also wrote this pretty interesting testing framework uh, that isolated some C++ libraries in this really large, complicated application and allowed for like uh, essentially a level of integration testing that hadn't been possible before that work. So, um, well, why Python? I, I mentioned JavaScript was popular, but you know, doing some code archaeology um, in our repos, I found that there's a lot of other languages that the company has uh, investigated or is using to a certain extent uh, within the company today, but none of them have really achieved the level of success that Python has. There are three pillars, really, to how we built up Python to be successful. You know, the first was strong community interest. But you know, this in itself is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for success. On top of that, uh, we put together organizations that uh, helped us manage communication and coordination uh, throughout the Python community. And we also organized you know, planned technical support for Python. So, the community interest you know, started out as it might do at a lot of other companies. People were looking at it as like this great general purpose tool with the batteries included. You could do your data analysis with it. You could play around with machine learning and you know, other cool stuff. And uh, you could stand up web services with it pretty easily. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough at Bloomberg. Uh, the company had a lot of bespoke network and database uh, APIs that were used by most of the applications there. And so if you do all this work, you're an island unto yourself. You really can't communicate the results of your work to other applications within the company. Then, as often happens in innovation, an intern project got started. 
And uh, this person took some of the more popular C++ libraries, created a wrapper around them so that they could be embedded into the Python interpreter, and suddenly people were able to write real business applications and communicate with other applications in the company, and uh, things started to take off. So at about the same time, uh, the company embraced this concept of a guild. We have this nice bureaucratic definition here, but essentially, a guild is a, a group of volunteers who are focusing on a, a technology considered important to Bloomberg and working to promote it, the best use of that technology. Uh, the Python Guild is just one of several guilds. There's also like a database guild, um, uh, a JavaScript guild, a C++ guild, um, you know, a testing guild, but uh, our guild is focused on like helping communicate with the uh, internal Python community at Bloomberg. Um, they organize meetings, they send out newsletters, um, they contribute to internal projects. There's also some open source contributions that go on. And uh, early on, they are also doing some work to maintain this extended interpreter that I mentioned earlier. Uh, for technical support, the Python infrastructure team was started in uh, early 2016. There was one person in San Francisco. Um, a few months after it started, I was hired as number two. And uh, this is our office. Uh, it, it's a really nice office. It's one of the nicer offices I've worked in. A lot of the Bloomberg offices are, are pretty spiff. I'm fond of this one. So. The, uh, my team, you know, we set out some objectives about what we need to do on the technical side. Like, we needed to stabilize what was in front of us. Um, the C++ extensions in this interpreter had some issues, and we had to deal with those. We needed to figure out how we were going to move forward with how these libraries had been wrapped. We needed to figure out how to manage the interpreters and upgrades to them. And uh, packaging and deployment was also a bit of a challenge. And you know, this was just two people, okay? <laughs> and we also were like setting out standards about how to use these, um, the interpreter and these libraries as well, you know, trying to document a bunch of stuff. So, so when I arrived, the community was like running ahead of what the guild and the infrastructure team were doing. You know, they were downloading just random versions of Python and building up applications out of it. They were creating one-offs of the extended interpreter that uh, the intern had created. Um, there was a lot of dependency management issues that were creeping up. And this was especially problematic in this environment because it, our infrastructure had been built around this concept of C++ applications, which are distributed as big, standalone binary blobs. And uh, you know, uh, the notion of shared applications on a server, you know, running out of one interpreter setup, uh, didn't really play well with that. The C++ wrapper, it had a lot of uh, drawbacks as well. While it was popular and a lot of people were using it, um, it was a thin wrapper over the C++ code. And um, because of that, a lot of C++ idioms percolated to the top. So there was like uh, a bunch of classes there that you wouldn't need in a normal Python environment. And the naming conventions looked like C++ code. So it looked like you're writing C++ without the curly braces. It wasn't that great to look at. Um, there were also a lot of issues around memory management because writing this kind of code when you're, you know, a normal path for developing a binary extension is you write it with that purpose in mind. Wrapping code that was never intended for that is quite a bit more complicated. So the um, Python community, while it was largely volunteer driven early on, now they're um, relying more on the guild. 
or they're participating in the guild to help facilitate what's going on in Python. Uh, they're also contributing to what the infrastructure team is doing in various ways. And uh, they're standing up their own inner source projects. So that's also really pretty interesting to see. Um, the guild early on had a lot of challenges it was facing, you know, so it was all a volunteer effort. Um, it was a very small team. There was an awful lot to do. You know, burnout was like an easy thing to uh, face. So we changed the guidelines for participation. Um, it used to be, you know, you had to be very experienced in the details of Python to join. We said, well, all you have to have is an interest in participating. Doesn't matter what your skill level is. We'll, we, there's lots of work here to do. We'll find something that's appropriate for you. Or you can come with your own idea and work on that. And um, we adopted this uh, structure of working groups, which are kind of like little committees. So my team's challenges, um, you know, we had to get reined in all these different versions of Python that were cropping up and you know, get like proper management of these things for rolling out. We also had to uh, smooth out the whole deployment process. And to do this all for like multiple architectures where you know, compilers and backends and various things didn't really want to play nice with each other or, or with what we were trying to do. So one of the first things we did was you know, just draw some clear lines about what we're, our goals were. Um, we also adopted um, an inner source model. So all of our projects are open. Communication about what we're doing is very open. Uh, we are very um, welcoming of issues and pull requests to the projects that we have. And uh, we're constantly, constantly engaged in conversations with the community, often in online forums like chat rooms, where people come to us with various questions. In fact, I was just dealing with one or, like three hours ago. Was, so <laughs> it, it, it's a big part of our job, is this communication aspect. The, um, my team uh, focused on using the guild as a representative of the community. So we went to them to get feedback on the plans that we had for going forward and the designs that were coming up for the APIs that were going to replace the C++ wrappers that had been created before. Uh, we, they helped us uh, send out newsletters you know, to update the Bloomberg uh, engineers about what was going on. Um, they also helped organize internal meetups uh, where we could present the technology we'd been developing. And um, we also um, got their involvement in the online conversations so that we weren't always asking the questions. Uh, often the Guild would step in and, and help us with those issues. We also put together, um, you know, got the organized documentation organized. You know, before it was all kind of scattered and hard to find and we kind of centralized it a bit. Um, it began with a very simple mission statement and an FAQ and kind of grew from there as we produced packages. Uh, we built a lot of documentation for those as well. Um, so there's now like reference manuals for each of the packages we support. There's a bunch of how-to guides. Um, I have no idea what the total size would be if you print it out, but I think it would be pretty substantial. So um, the other thing is that um, we needed a plan for how to replace that extended interpreter. You know, it was just too ugly to support. So we decided to provide packages for each of the important C++ libraries that were involved and you know, just dramatically changed the architecture of these things and um, really reduced the source of maintenance on these. So. To um, start off, we picked one of the most popular packages that was being used in the company, or popular C++ libraries, really. 
and um, said, well, what is the minimum amount of functionality we can ship for this library that will gain attention and be useful you know, for delivering value? Um, we r ran through our um, uh, designs with um, the Guild and um, worked hard to uh, come up with something that supported you know, Python idioms, you know, had really good performance because that was important to people and wanted something that was really reliable. Uh, but, you know, we roll out our first release and crickets, you know, <laughs> so nobody wanted to pick it up first. And, you know, so that took a bit of effort. Uh, again, we got help from the Guild on this. You know, we had a lot more conversations with the community about what we had when they came to us with problems about the old API. We would suggest they try the new one as an alternative. Um, over time, we showed that we had a really good track record, both on the performance aspects and on reliability, which also helped uh, pick up a, a adoption of these things. Um, so today, Python is a first-class language within the company. Um, it's, if you go to our careers site, just we have a career site, and do a search for Python, uh, it's the most popular job entry in a job description for languages there. It easily outnumbers what's there for C++ and JavaScript. Um, when we bring on new hires, we um, start them off with Python as a language for introducing the concepts for how applications are built in the company. And um, there's really uh, no reason to not use it when you're developing a new application except for like very special use cases. Um, we've seen the internal community grow to several thousand. Um, we've seen a lot of growth in community-driven projects as well. And what I like is they've kind of modeled how they do their projects after the way my team does them. So these projects also come out with good documentation, high reliability, good design. Um, what I thought was really interesting is the authors of the C++ library have also embraced what we've done. You know, so they're taking our libraries and using them you know, in their own testing. They're also um, using Python to write their own utilities. The way the guild is currently structured is we have two co-leads. Uh, I like to call them the, uh, or two co-chairs. I like to call them the Python Devon. You yeah, know, that sounds kind of open and welcoming. Uh, we have about a dozen working groups uh, staffed by about 20 members. Each working group focuses on a sp specific issue. There's one, um, working group that was responsible for helping organize all of Bloomberg's participation at this conference. And I don't know how we could have done all this without him. It, we hold twice monthly meetings and uh, we have a public, publicly shared agenda. So anyone is welcome to attend our meetings and uh, often they just lurk, but sometimes they jump in with good questions or comments. My team has grown. I'm happy to say it's no longer just two people. Um, four of my team members are attending uh, PyCon. Um, Mario and Pablo are also presenting. They're you know, pretty famous within the Python community. Cutting in and out. Uh, Matt Wisniewski is also attending. He is uh, one of the contributors to the um, memory project that we just open sourced, which has gotten a lot of uh, buzz. Uh, we continue to work with the Guild. In fact, two of uh, my team members are uh, Guild um, working group leads. And uh, we talk to each other constantly, like on a kind of a cross consulting basis. It, it's a relationship that works really well for us. Most of the uh, C++ wrappers, the packages that we developed, are now in maintenance mode. And uh, I'm really happy to say that they very rarely cause any problems uh, within uh, Bloomberg in terms of like production problems or um, 
you know, just issues in general. So uh, we achieve, achieved quite a bit there. A lot of our work now focuses on like improving the upgrade cycle for interpreters and uh, getting a better development experience in our programmers' hands. So, you know, it, it's just hard to cut over to new versions of interpreters, especially like bridging from two to three. So we, we've done a lot of work to try to help people with that and with packaging, package changes. Our packages are very stable, but you know, outside third-party packages, uh, not so much. On um, the developer experience side, you know, deployment is still a big issue. We've done a lot of work to improve that. We've got a bunch of uh, best of class um, um, diagnostic tools. Memory is one of them. I'm hoping we can open source some of the others. Uh, we're constantly working on our documentation and uh, you know, also communication. You know, it, it's all about communication. So for cultivating guilds, like if this is something you want to do in your own company, your own enterprise, um, there are a few things that work. You know, you can't like expect this to happen strictly on a volunteer after hours basis. It has to be something that um, is considered part of the developer's responsibilities. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a high priority. You know, other things always take priority, but uh, you know, time has to be accounted for it on the management side. Uh, my team is globally distributed. I'm in San Francisco. Uh, some of our team is in New York. The rest is in London, in Europe. Um, this is unusual. Uh, this is, predates the pandemic, in fact, and uh, it's something that we propose to them. Uh, the company has a history of co-locating teams, um, but they made an exception for us and we've been able to make it work really well. And other teams are now picking up our model as well. So the other thing we're working with uh, on management is improving how the whole upgrade life cycle works. You know, like a lot of people tend to look at it as like a secondary activity. It doesn't really improve revenue. Um, if it isn't broken, why do I have to pay attention to it? Um, and so we have to inform people of the risks here and uh, how it, to plan it out as like future activities. Uh, for projects. So one of the other challenges that we found is because we are globally distributed, not just as a team, but as a company, a lot of our communication takes place in these online forums. And it's very easy to, to get tired or um, make a, a comment that co comes off as too curt or sarcastic or rude. And, uh, you know, cause a bad reaction. Now, Bloomberg prides itself on being a very uh, civil and inclusive community. And so occasionally this does happen though, where you know, something inappropriate or um, rude you know, was said and uh, we have to like have a conversation. Often that goes through the guild if, you know, and that's all that has to happen. But um, I'm, Happy to say, you know, that's become much less a pro problem over time. I think the people participating in these conversations are sending a good example and, uh, you know, keeping the water level up and on, on the conversation, so. Um, I mentioned Memray earlier. Uh, this is a fantastic tool for diagnosing uh, what's going on in the memory of your application. It not only looks at what's going on in your um, Python code, but it will dig into the binary extensions that you're using, regardless of what language it was written in, and give you a good view of what's happening there. Um, and I should mention that some other uh, Bloomberg um, colleagues are talking at uh, PyCon as well. Uh, there's a, a great talk later today by Nandita and Sagar uh, um, about uh, the transition to open source. Uh, Fred Phillips is talking uh, tomorrow about uh, the import system. And uh, Bernat 
Uh, he's a great guy. He's going to be um, talking about editable installs. He's also a, a big contributor to the uh, Tox project. So when I wrote this, I thought I would have time for questions. I'm, as I understand it right now, questions will be taking place in the open area. Um, but thank you all for attending and for waiting uh, a little extra for lunch. <laughs> so thank you. Oh,